coming from the throne, coming from his throne, his sanctuary today. A few, not too long ago, Pastor talked about the river in the book of, the, of Ezekiel that started at the door of the sanctuary and flowed until there were waters to swim in. James talks about how every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift. And he said, in, in the Message Bible, it says it this way. He says the gifts are rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. Rivers of light bringing those gifts. And you may be dry. You may think you're in a dry land, dry and thirsty, searching for something, something to hold on to. But God said there's a river. There's a river flowing from heaven. There's a river flowing from the Father. And it brings every good and perfect gift that you can think. Not just the things you think you need, but everything that your Father knows you need. Isaiah 41, it says, you may think you're poor and needy. You may think there's no water. It's dry in your spirit. But Isaiah says, when the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. God will not forsake you. He'll hear you in your cry. And he says, I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I'm here to tell you today, no matter how dry it may seem, no matter what kind of valley you're in, there's a pool of water there. There's a fountain. There are rivers of anointing. There are rivers flowing. I pray today that we would all worship Him and glorify Him, the giver of life, the giver of those rivers of blessing. When He gives those gifts, our greatest response is to give back to Him. God, thank you for those gifts you give. I give them back to you in praise and in worship right now. I praise you for those gifts you've given, for that river of life. Let that river spring up. Let it be a well springing up in me, God. I pray in the name of Jesus. Let your gifts flow freely in this house today in the name of Jesus. Let the rivers of life flow in this place as we worship you and as we praise you today in this house. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You can put our hands together. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Come on. The righteous runneth into it and are saved. Hallelujah. We're safe. Come on. From the world. Oh, from the corruption of lust. Come on, your name is forever to be praised. Let's lift him up. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We exalt your name, Jesus. We exalt your name, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. It's the name I 
lift up. It's the name I praise. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing every nation. Every nation. All creation. We proclaim your name. Somebody do that right now. Every nation. All creation. We proclaim. Come on. We lift up the name of Jesus. Every nation, every nation, all creation, we proclaim your name. Every nation, every nation, all creation. Come on, everything that has breath, we bless your name. shall confess thank you Lord we magnify your great name in this place today we exalt you blessed be the name of Jesus you can find your seats if you continue to worship hallelujah oh yes isn't the name of Jesus wonderful Oh yes, isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? No other name. All the world can come to Him to have their sins removed. And isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Come on, it's beautiful. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? You just close your eyes, sing this to him. Oh, so beautiful. We magnify the name. It's Son of God and one of us, the lover of my soul. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Sing eternal king, eternal king, you will reign forever, and we will sing the glory of your name, hallelujah, be lifted high for all the world to see, your name is all we need, your name all we need eternal king 
eternal King. You will reign all forever and ever, and we will sing the glory of your name. Powerful is in the name of Jesus. Powerful, it changed our broken when it spoke. Every knee must bow. Is in the name of Jesus. Powerful, oh, yes, eternal King. Sing the glory forever and ever, Lord. Be lifted high. God, we lift you high. Oh, for everybody to see, Lord. Your name, your name is all we need. There is freedom. There is freedom in the name. There is healing in the name. There is power in the name salvation in the name there is life in the name there is no other name besides your name so we call on you come on somebody sing there's freedom there is freedom in the name come on do you believe that today truth he's the way he's the way the truth the life the only way to God is in the name of Jesus all we need if you believe that can you lift your hands to heaven right now begin to call on the name of Jesus come on we magnify your name we worship your name hallelujah of the Lord in this place today isn't the name of Jesus beautiful would you just 
just like to bask in his presence for a few moments. Let's don't just rush right by this. You're wonderful counselor. You're mighty God. You're our everlasting Father, the supplier of every good and perfect gift, Lord. You are truly all that we need. Uh, captivate our hearts today, God. Do your work in every heart, mind, and soul. God, you know what we have need of today before we even ask. But let faith grab a hold of it today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I don't know about you, but I've really been enjoying what I feel in the presence of the Lord. I think something is shifting in the spirit. Do you feel what I feel? Is it just me? I feel God calling us to a, a higher plane, calling us to more of Him, less of me. I don't know about you, that's a challenge for me. I kind of get comfortable with life, but if I'm going to make more room, there is, there's no more space in life. So you've got to clear something out to make more room for him. But it's such a sweet reward when you do. Such a sweet peace. That contentment that we're all searching for, that thing that we think is going to bring it, that thing is a person, Jesus. I pray that he have his way in you in us because there is a city church that hungers for what we feel in here today the peace that passes understanding doesn't mean that everything in life is perfect but there's a peace that overshadows all of that our hope is in him hallelujah I wonder if you'd stand with me all over the sanctuary I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer today ask God to have his way in this place would ask that you would remember pastor his home sickness in his body needing a touch from the Lord also sister Sarah Ray lost her grandfather today I wonder if you just pray that the peace of God would minister to that family how do you believe that God can speak a word of peace hallelujah just pray that God would have his way in this place today. I don't know exactly what God wants to do, but I believe if each one of us will open our heart and our spirit, we can be transformed. There can be a transformative power of God that would move in this place. I feel the liberty here. We just need to step into the flow together. Father, we thank you today for your sweet presence in this place. Oh, God, keep calling, keep beckoning. Draw us near to you today because in your presence, Lord, is that fullness of joy that our hearts seek for. I pray that you would minister freely in this place, God, and draw each one of us into an embrace with you. Let your glorious presence rule and reign. Have your way in this place. I pray you would minister to pastor, put strength and virtue in his body. Raise him up, God, and give him strength, and we'll give you glory. I pray that you would minister to Sister Sarah and her family. Let the peace of God that does pass all understanding, every situation, Lord, every dilemma, every darkness, Shine your light in peace, I pray. And let the goodness of God be upon her and flow through her, I ask. And we'll give you glory today, God. We honor and magnify your name because you're worthy. Oh, would you give the Lord another hand clap of praise? He is worthy. Hallelujah. You're worthy, Jesus. The highest praise, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Lifted high. Hallelujah. Oh, isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? You may be seated. We're going to invite the ushers if they would come. Wait on us today for our tithe and offering as they do. Just want to remind you and encourage you. This is the last week of our Daniel fast. There's something about when brothers and sisters come together in unity. That's where God commands the blessing. When we're denying ourselves, God takes note of those things it doesn't go unnoticed by God so I pray that you would continue be steadfast in this time of fasting um, and this is the last week we're going to be doing away with everything except for fruits and vegetables and so encourage one another if you think about somebody would you just send them a text give them a call on the phone let them know that you're thinking and praying there's something about encouragement that builds up the body of Christ
Father, bless us today as we give back to your kingdom. We thank you for your blessings in our life and ask that you would multiply this, Lord, that it may be a blessing to your kingdom. We'll give you glory in Jesus' name. I 
I'm in all of you. I stand in all of you. I worship you, Jesus. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. Come on, somebody call on that name. Jesus. Come on, with faith believing. Jesus. One more time. Oh, yes. Jesus. For it reaches. Come on. To the highest. To the highest mountain. Come on. The blood still works today. There's power. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, it's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Sing it reaches. For it reaches to the highest mountain. to the lowest valley no matter where I'm at today it's the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never oh it will never somebody declare me strength from day to day it will never lose its power for it reaches oh for it reaches to the highest mountain come on does somebody want to say thank you Lord and it flows to the Lord Thank you, Lord. It's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose. It will never lose. It will never lose. It's power. Sing it, soothes my doubts. It's And it calms my fears. Oh, yes. Mm, and it dries all my tears. Come on. Every tear is wiped away. Oh, yes. It's the blood. It's the blood that gives me strength. From day to day, it will never lose its power. Choir, would you come? For it reaches, for it reaches to the highest mountain. Oh, and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, yes. For it's the blood that gives me strength from day to day.
Beautiful song, beautiful spirit, beautiful presence of the Lord. I'm grateful to be here. You may be seated. God bless you. I greet you all in the name of the Lord. I ask that the blessings of the Lord be upon you and upon your family. We're grateful for our visitors that are here. I believe I met Mike. There you are, Mike. It is Mike, isn't it? Glad you're here, Matthew. Amen. Praise God. There's an old chorus we used to sing. I guess we still do from time to time, but I'm not here all the time. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strong. sing it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strong. the light of his glory the Lord said look unto me from the ends of the earth and be lightened that is illuminated and relieved of the heavy burden Jesus said come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden and I'll give you rest you don't have to qualify just come Aren't you grateful? His name is wonderful. His name is beautiful. His name is powerful. We've sang it. His name is all we need. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Turn your eyes upon the Lord. I'm sorry I missed your moving services. I was in Mississippi preaching my mother's funeral. I thank you all for your prayers. Safe journey. We made it. We saw an awful lot that didn't in the ditch here, in the median there. But by the grace of God, we made it. And uh, we made it back. Now, you had the privilege of listening to a prophetic preacher who not only proclaimed the prophetic word, but, but actually prophesied to you as a congregation, as an individual. I'm not necessarily a prophetic preacher, but I hope what I say will be profitable. Because it will be, I promise you, the word of the Lord. I thought about just preaching, hang in there. But who likes the word hang? Or as I put on the, the door of our refrigerator for my wife when she was just all flustered and fluttered about something, it said, keep calm and carry on. Just keep on keeping on. But I chose today for my subject just simply live. Live. God said of Israel, you were born but not swaddled. Your navel cord had not been cut. Neither were you wrapped in swaddling clothes. You lay there in your own blood, 
dying. And I passed by. And I said, live. Aren't you glad God's passed by? Aren't you glad he cast his attention upon you? And his word is live. Simply live. My subject is simply live the simple life. The things of this world, so distracting, so demanding. They're like the odyssey of Homer, the the wailing of the of the serenes of fantasy. Only this is not fantasy. This is where we live in this present world. John, I'm going to to use several verses today. I'll just throw them out at you and then we'll go back and read them. John 10, 10, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4, Revelations 2, 10, 1 Corinthians 7, 25, Ephesians 1, 1, Hebrews 10, 23, Revelations 19, 11, 13, 14, 16, Revelation 17, 14, and for my text and I'll get to it at the end of the message Luke chapter 9 verse 57 through 62 John 10 and 10 Jesus said the thief cometh that you can be sure of there's always going to be something coming to steal it cometh but for steal and to kill and to destroy I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly Or as one translator said, my purpose is to give them rich and satisfying life. Everything in this world declares that not to be so. I talked to a young man the other day in the store, and he said, oh, my grandmother was, and they wouldn't let her do this, and they wouldn't let her do that. Everything in this world is calculated to make you believe God doesn't want you to have a rich and abundant life. Yet Jesus said, that's why I'm here, to give you a rich and satisfying life, a real eternal life, a life more and better than you ever dreamed of, life in its ultimate fullness. Jesus said, that's why I'm come. And when he speaks to you, that's why he speaks. He's not looking for fault. He sees that. For we've all sinned and come short. He's looking for faith. Because if he can find faith, the blood of atonement can cover. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 4 The Apostle Paul says, Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, he says, bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And then he turns and says in verse 3, But I am apprehensive. I am very anxious. I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You don't have to be sophisticated to live for God. In fact, sophistication is a sense of knowledge. And the Bible says, knowledge puffeth up. But aren't you grateful that the grace and the love of God can give you real substance in your being? It's just plain and simple. God said, that's a fact. Someone said, God said it, I believe it, and that's the way it is. No, honey, whether you believe it or not, if God said it, that's the way it is. But the apostle says, I'm afraid that somehow, some way, through some gimmick or device or appeal, that you're going to be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And then in verse 4, he goes on to say, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom you have not preached, we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, You might well bear with him. The expression is ironical. The apostle Paul says, you gladly endure these false teachers. Why do you not endure me? 
And then he goes on, and we won't go there, but he goes on and says, I'm not one whit behind the rest of them. And he starts talking about what God's done in his life, how God's called him, how God's qualified him, and the authority that God's given. In fact, later on in that same chapter, he says, you that think yourselves are spiritual, then you acknowledge that the words I speak unto you, they are the word of God. Why won't you bear with me, he said. Everyone that comes along and tickles your ear. Another Jesus? Come on, folks. Acts 4 and 10, there's a man that's been healed who's been lame in his legs for 40 years at the very gate of the temple. And the Peter and Paul, or Peter and John passed by and said, Silver and gold we don't have, but such as we do have. Aren't you glad that as a child of God, anointed, spirit filled, baptized in his name, you got something? You've got something the world needs. Such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Oh, friend, it wasn't just their faith. They were declaring what they had. The Bible said that man looked upon them desiring, expecting. I would to God today that while the word is going forth, somebody's soul would just cause you to lift up and expect that if God said it, that's the way it is. It's just simply living the simple life and then they were before the crowd and they were being examined and analyzed and criticized by all the religious professionals and the apostles said that if we be examined today even for this good deed that is done then let it be known that by the name of Jesus Christ whom you crucified had God raised from the grave that by his name does this man stand here before you sound and healthy in body for he goes on to say in verse 12 for there is now salvation deliverance healing help hope eternal life in none other another Jesus Paul said you listen to that guy but why don't you listen to me when I tell you there is none other for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved Allah can't save you Buddha can't save you Krishna can't save you but there there's one who came, God manifest in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, God for us, and he can, and he will. Corrupted away from the simplicity of the gospel that is in Christ. Another spirit Concerning another Jesus, the message said salvation come no other way. No other name has been or will be given to us by which we can be saved. Only this one. Aren't you glad you call on his name? Another spirit? Wow. Ephesians 4 and 3 said there's one body and one spirit. Hello, you can deal that with the Godhead. You can deal that with the church. Come on. And the closer we get to Jesus, like the spokes of a wagon, the clo- getting to a hub, the closer we'll get to one another. Because if we walk in the light as he is in the light, uh, then we will have a fellowship one with the other. And we will discover, behold, how good and pleasant it is uh, for brethren uh, to dwell together in unity. Why? Because there is an anointed spirit. There is not another. John 14 and 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I'm not going to forsake you like orphans on a street corner. I will come unto you. And in that day, you will know I am in you and you in me. Isn't it wonderful to know that when the Holy Ghost floods your life, the Holy Ghost fills you, your spirit is joined to God's spirit, that at that particular moment, you are both indwelt with Christ and you are enfolded, embraced, wrapped in His arms of grace. Would you like to lift your hands and thank Him for the simplicity that is in Christ? No other Jesus, no other spirit, no other gospel. In fact, Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians 1, verses 6 and 7, I am, I marvel, he says, that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ, unto another gospel. 
Just, I, I marvel. He said, you bear with those guys that wave a different flag, that, that sing a different song. Why won't you bear with me, the apostle said. I marvel that you are so quickly drawn away to those who would preach to you another gospel, which, he says, is not another. There is but one gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you're told to believe the gospel, what do you believe? You believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins, that he was buried in a tomb that he wasn't going to stay in long, and that he rose again the third day. Come on, folks, that's the gospel. You believe it? Hello? How do you obey it? The Bible says to believe and to obey the gospel. I believe that. Then how do you obey it? How was it obeyed in the book of Acts? Well, they repented. That's dying out to a sinful lifestyle. They were baptized in the water in the name of Jesus Christ. And Romans 6 says that we are buried with him in baptism. That's obeying the gospel. Amen. It says, and then we rise to walk in a newness of life. That is, receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repentance, what a baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. The infilling of the Holy Ghost was the gospel message that was preached on the birthday of the church not on the day the Catholic church was instituted in 312 not on the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door in Wittenberg, Germany not during the Protestant Reformation thank God for every ounce of light, every ounce of faith that has drawn men closer to God, but I want to go back to the root, I want to go back to the original, I want to go back to the first gospel, and I want to stand on it because in truth friend there is no other gospel but there are those that troubled you and would pervert twist diminish the gospel of Christ live the simple life the simple truth of the simple life is that if we're going to be Christians, we must be apostolic. By apostolic, I'm not going back to the history of the apostolic fathers. Uh, they were neither apostles nor fathers, uh, amen, of the church. I'm not going back to some denomination that calls itself apostolic, uh, amen. Uh, I'm just simply saying we need to go back to the foundation of the New Testament church. Uh, Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 2 and verse 20, and he says, you were built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So to be apostolic, we need to be apostolic in doctrine, that is teaching. Acts 2.38, amen, they said, men and brethren, in verse 37, what shall we do? Tell us, teach us, give us some direction, give us some hope. We've crucified our Messiah. What is our hope? And the apostle simply says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I didn't write that. I didn't think that up. That's God's word. Come on, folks. I'm talking about one gospel. I'm talking about one spirit. I'm talking about one Jesus. I'm talking about book of Acts salvation. Oh, hallelujah. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Apostolic doctrine. We need to be apostolic and dynamic. John 20, 22, Jesus said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And everything that they did for the 33 years that the book of Acts talks about. All the churches that are founded. You read about Romans and find that it was started in the book of Acts. You read about the Corinthians. It was started in the book of Acts. The Ephesians, the Galatians, the, the uh, Thessalonians, and on and on and on. It all started in the book of Acts because there was a dynamic. There was an electrifying anointing of God that were Wherever they went, there was an anointing of God in their life. We need to live that way. Not Sunday afternoon in church. Not just Wednesday night in church. But when you get out of the bed in the morning, you need to reach up and reconsecrate and plug in again, Lord. Let your dynamics operate in my thinking today. Let your dynamics operate in my speaking today. Let your dynamics operate in my behavior. Apostolic doctrine apostolic dynamics and apostolic devotion Acts 15 and 26 
Paul and Silas has been to Jerusalem to solve the question of are the Gentiles required to be circumcised or are they not? And they got the answer. And with a letter from the council of Jerusalem along with chosen men, the Bible think one of them was Julius and, and I can't think of the other at the moment, but, but they wrote and they said, we have sent with the apostle Paul and, and Barnabas, we have sent men who have hazarded their lives for this gospel. You've never even had your nose busted. Well, Sister Lashley did the other day, but not for the gospel. Hello, you've not suffered a, a loss of one drop of blood for the gospel. Oh, but somebody's going to say something about me. Oh, i got friends, and I've got relatives, and I've got ancestors. Uh, come on, folks. You've got a God that you're going to have to walk before pleasing. Uh, you've got a Jesus that you owe everything to. You've got a spirit that you want to anoint your life, and there is a gospel you want to light the way. Hello. Amen. Revelations 2 and, and uh, uh, 10 says to be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. But in chapter 12 verse 11, and we sang it today. Hello. By the word. Come on, how many times did we say testimony, testimony, testimony? And we dealt with the blood and the testimony. But we forgot the bottom line. I know it just didn't fit in the song. You can't say everything from Genesis 1-1, Revelation 22-21 at one time. Even though Brother Lashley does seem to try. But the power, final part, it says, and who loved, is it on the wall? Not their life, even to death, unto death. We are so in love with ourselves. How much time do you spend getting the hair just right? How long does it take you to pick out just that right combination? I'm trapped. Sister Terry said blue is my color. Here I am in blue. <laughs> Who loved not their life. You want somebody that can turn the world upside down? Give me somebody that knows Jesus, the one and true, the eternal God. Someone that really is anointed with his spirit. And someone that's got a devotion that says, if I die, I die. I'm going to obey God. I'm not talking about an arrogant, self-righteous Bless God, I'm the. When you get that attitude, you're the, all right, but that's the the you don't want to be. Hello? Be faithful. Psalms 40 and verse 8 says, Lord, I delight. What do you delight in? What really turns you on? What's your high water mark day by day? Lord, I delight to do thy will because your word, your law, is in my heart. How did it get there? David said, thy word have I hid in my heart. I did it. Come on, I did it. I thought whenever we had this, this uh, fast de uh, declared that before the fast was over, I'd get to read the entire New Testament again through. And then I had other situations, but I'm still going to do my very best to read it through. I want it in my heart. I want it to dominate my mind. I want it to, I want it to rule my dreams. When I wake up in the middle of the night, I want the word of the Lord. I want to wake up speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gives me utterance. I want to wake up thanking God, rejoicing in God. That's my desire. I delight to do thy will. He said in Revelations 2 and 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 25, that God has counted me as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I obtained mercy to be faithful. I understand that when I look back at the many times I've stumbled and fumbled and misstepped and misspoke. Anybody identify with me? I received mercy to be faithful, to get up, to start over. Hello? To begin again. Ephesians 1 and 1. Paul said, to the saints which are in Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. It's not that I've just been born again. I am faithfully endeavoring to walk with him day by day. 1 Timothy 1 and 12, Paul said, I thank Jesus Christ, our Christ Jesus our Lord. He counted me 
faithful. Oh, if there's anything I desire that God label me, I want him to count me faithful. I, I may not be great. Uh, I may not be popular. And I may not know how to do a lot of things. Uh, but if I can just simply live the simple life uh, of being faithful, uh, of believing and trusting and clinging to him, he counted me to be faithful. Hello. Hebrews 10, 23 Paul appeals and says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. So you said you believe God. So you said you consecrated your life to him. So you said that you're going to serve him. He said, hold fast unto the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Revelations 19 and 11, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful. And true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. That means both atonement and victorious. I tread the winepress of the wrath of God alone. Victorious, but he also shed his blood for you and for me. Would you like to lift his hands and thank him for the blood of atonement? The life of the flesh is the blood. It's in the blood. And I have given you the blood upon the altar, for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Thank you, Jesus, for a blood-dipped garment. Thank you, Lord. And his name is called the Word of God. 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. In the 17th chapter, in the 14th verse, it says, And they that are with him, three things, they are called. Aren't you glad you heard the voice of the Lord? Hello? Anybody here other than myself at the first said, Lord, wait. Hello? I got to think this thing through. I got to figure it out. Hello? I'm so sorry that I didn't just answer the call. They are called, they are chosen, and they are faithful. In Luke 962, the Bible says it came to pass in verse 57 that as Jesus and his disciples went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I'll follow thee whithersoever thou goest. What a way to start a conversation with the Lord. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll say what you want me to say. And then the Lord answered and said, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. End of conversation. No further record of what the guy did. End of it. Hello? I'll go, Lord, as long as you give me a limousine, as long as you give me a, a flowery bed, as long as you make it right so that I can do what I want to do and enjoy what I want to enjoy and not really have any problems and nobody point the finger at me and say, you're different. If you aren't different, you're lost. I'm afraid. A woman told me one time, she said, I don't want my children to be called different, to look different. Hey, folks, I'm so glad that our children can look different, live different. Speak different. That's not arrogance. That's gratitude. That's gratitude. Conversation ended. And he said unto another, follow me. But the other said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. What a quaint phrase. Me first. That's the world we live in. There's no such thing as manners anymore, modesty anymore, morals anymore. You preach restraint. That's legalism. Grace is free. So is hell. Hello? So is misery. So is heartache. So is ruination. So is busted relationships. Divided homes. It's all free. 
until the afterwards. Suffer me first to go bury my father. If you do any reading on that, you'll find that that was a colloquial saying in those days when somebody didn't want to do anything. They would say, uh, suffer me first to bury my father. Their father may be in perfect health, not a sick bone in his body. But I, I got responsibilities to my dad. I'm going to wait until he dies. And then, hello, me first. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury thy dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. End the conversation. Hello? I mean, isn't it abrupt how conversations just stop and you don't hear anything more about? Verse 61. And another, this is the third guy. Another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first. Whether it's bury my dad or take care of whatever. How many young people have made a consecration to God saying, Lord, now when I get that special one, then I'm going to consecrate my life. When I get out of school, how many adults will be up? When I get that special promotion. Come on. When I get that, that right amount in my retirement. Good luck. Wish you well. Suffer, but let me first go bid them farewell that are at my home or at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, now listen to this verse. This is my text. You're going to live the simple life or you're simply not going to live it. All sophistication set aside. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. I have that scar in my past. I know what it is to start and turn back. I know what it is to fall. But the Lord is simply saying here, No procrastination. No backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off until tomorrow. Tell me who plans to die tonight. Everybody thinks in terms of tomorrow. The sick thinks, I'll be well tomorrow. You don't put the kingdom of God off until tomorrow. The translator says, seize the day. And I would add, Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Simply live the life. The Living Bible says, Anyone who lets himself be distracted from the work I plan for him is not fit for the kingdom of God. Sin, the sin nature that was aptly described this morning. Self-interest, these be fog and be cloud the heart. In the heart, you mean to, you plan to, you hope to, but me first. I got things on my schedule, then clear it. I got things in my plans, change them. God first. James 1, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. What is it? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 says, But... Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. According to Psalms 24, verses 3 and 4, if you're going to abide in God's heel and His holy mount, you're going to come into His temple, you're going to come into His presence, you're going to really know Him as He is, then clean hands and a pure heart are demanded. Clean hands and a pure heart to come into His presence. Clean hands. The word pure means clean, clear, pure-hearted. If you're that way, then you can be in his presence and you can see God in his presence as he operates in your life. You can 
fellowship his presence. You can come under and abide under his anointing, and you can behold the glory of God as he transforms your life from day to day, step by step. A singleness of motive. That's what purity is. It's a single eye, a singleness of heart in everything that shapes our life. Everything you think, how does this affect the kingdom and how does this prepare you to be a witness of the king? Everything you say, how does this affect the kingdom? Well, I'm not thinking about the kingdom right now. I'm just upset with, whoa, wait a minute. Hello? Blessed are the pure in heart. That pure heart shapes everything in your life and mine. Our thoughts, our words, our behavior. If you can put everything in your life in God's hand, then you can see God's hand in everything in your life. All things work together for good to them that love God. Hello? How are we supposed to love God? With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, first and foremost, not first me or me first. Simply living the simple life. The simple life is a life that is singularly and continually focused, purposed on Jesus. On Jesus. Not a divided motive. Not a double eye. Not a double heart. Not a if this and that. But just totally interested in loyally serving God. You'll make enough mistakes when you're determined to be loyal without making room in your heart to make mistakes. The only way we can be pure-hearted is to be totally devoted to Him with an apostolic devotion and with God's grace, you can live. Well, I don't believe I can live this life. Oh, yes, you can. Don't you believe the devil's lie? You can live the simple life. You can do it. You can live the more abundant life because that is the simple life. What is it I heard today? There's only so much room, and if you got it filled with other stuff, there's no more room for Jesus. But if you'll simplify, if you'll focus, what is it? David said, I have fixed my heart. My heart is fixed. The prophet said, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose Mind is stayed upon thee. The apostle said, set your affection. Don't let the world set your affection. There are guys that are making millions of dollars a year just telling you what you want. Hello? You know you want to get a new car. You know you don't want to drive that one you're driving. I mean, actually, 16, 17, 18 season years old. Oh, but it still runs. Yeah, but uh, it would feel so much nicer if you had a new one. Come on, folks. I'm just saying that if you just completely set your mind on walking with God, he will open the door. I'm not preaching against new cars. Everybody say, Brother Lashley, not preaching against new cars. I'm not even being judgmental. I'm just trying to help us live the simple life, the more abundant life that Jesus you know how that life became available? Jesus suffered, and he died, and he was buried, and he rose again. Just to give you new life. It's not a light thing. It's not a little thing. It's a holy thing. First, he had to die in my place before he could give me the gift of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 3.11 John the Baptist said, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. The next three years of ministry, Jesus baptized nobody with the Holy Ghost and fire. And that's what John said he'd come to do. But to get there, he had to go by a whipping post. He had to go to a cross. He had to go to a grave. And then he could say, receive ye the Holy Ghost. We ought to appreciate, and I know you do, we ought to appreciate the price he paid so that you could live a simple life.
of victory. John 14 and 1, I've already mentioned it. We are indwelt and we are enfolded with Jesus. The pure life. It's the single life. It's the life that's focused on the presence, the plan, the purpose, the power, and the person of God. I want to walk pleasing before him. There's the truck line. Alice and I drive often on the road. Maybe some of you have seen it. Across the back of it, it says, we ship anything, anywhere, anytime. Anybody seen that? That's real spiritual, isn't it? We ship anything, anywhere, anytime. Driving behind that truck, I thought of Matthew 6, 33, the simple life. We seek first the kingdom of God, anywhere, hello, anytime, or all the time. The pure life is just a single life. A single devotion. A life that is willing. Revelations 22 and 17 said, The Spirit, that is the Holy Ghost, that's God, that's the Spirit of Christ, Jesus. The Spirit and the Bride, that's the church, openly invite and say, Come, whosoever will, whosoever will, come. The simple life, the victorious life, the purposed life, is the life that's willing. Whatever you wish, Lord, turn your eyes on him. Now, the purpose of the world around you is not to make you feel comfortable living for God. This whole world lies in wickedness. I can give you book, chapter, and verse for it. This whole world system is a distraction. Everything this world is up to is to distract you from the most important thing. What was it that the apostle said? This world. One thing? How many times does the pastor preach one thing? I come home from California, saw one thing signs all over this place. It's the devil's business through the system of the world, through the lust of your flesh, the pride of your uh, mind, and the lust of your eye. It is set up to distract you from that one simple thing of walking with Jesus. The world's function is to distract you. Jesus said, have a single eye. Now, to me, the single eye means to have an eye that's fixed on one goal, one object, one supreme purpose. Lord, I want to bring you glory. I want to show you I love you for the price you've paid. I tell him every day of my life, and I would recommend you to do the same. Jesus, I love you. From the bottom of my heart, from the depth of my soul. I love you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because that's what your word says do. And you said if you love me, you'll keep my word. I love you, Lord. And I want to proclaim to you and I want to pledge to you my life, my love, my loyalty. Every day, every day, every day. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they're going to live the simple life. They're going to see God. Purity is allowing nothing to distract. No distraction. Regardless of what life throws at me, I have to deal with it. But my eyes is upon him. That's why I ask that we sing the chorus together. There's a carelessness. I don't mean sloppy. I don't mean negligent. But I mean there is a quiet serenity about the simple life. There is a quietness of just simple, focused living. It enables steadfastness. Brother Lashley, I just always am falling down. I had a woman tell me one time, she said, Brother Lashley, what can I do to really walk with God? I said, do you read your Bible? Well, yeah. I said, go to the book of John, start in John chapter 1, verse 1. Read all the way through the book. She come back to me at the end of that week, next weekend. She said, Brother Lashley, I read it. and It don't make any sense. I said, start over. One, all the way through to the end. Second week, she came back. She said, it still don't make any sense. I said, read it again. Third week, she come back exasperated. She said, Brother Lashley, 
word goes through my mind just like water through a sieve. I said, you know what clean water does when it goes through a dirty sieve if you get enough clean water going through it? And your mind is a dirty mind. I thought being cruel, that was just being factual. I knew the woman. I said, so keep reading it. Keep reading it. Obviously, she didn't because years later, week after week after week on the weekend, she'd call me so drunk she could scarcely speak my name, but she knew my phone number. Folks, I'm just trying to say a pure life is a focused life. What do you want to live your life for? And if it's not for Jesus, you've got absolutely no control over what it's going to be. Steadfast, consecrated, constant, you know, just completely dedicated. Paul said, I don't know what waits on me, what's going to happen to me in Acts chapter 20. But he said, everywhere I go, the Spirit says that bondage and afflictions are in my future waiting on me. But in verse 24, he said, but none of these things move me. And the next phrase is the reason none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto me. In other words, he says, it doesn't matter what it takes. I'm going to finish my ministry and my witness. I'm calling you today. God's calling you today by his word. You've heard the prophet. You heard the prophecy. Now, let's hear from you. From your heart. Have you made up your mind? I'm going to live the life, the simple life, the focused life, day by day by day. Mm. Wow. The longer I live, the more I realize that the kingdom of heaven has to be taken by force. I just lost some of you. The longer I live, the more I realize that the kingdom of heaven must be taken by force. I must force my focus to be fo totally on Jesus. Anybody ever been reading the Word of God and before you knew it, your mind's off thinking about yeah. six different things? Yeah. The kingdom of God has to be taken by force. But you don't see anything. You don't have to see anything. There's just voices that are always whispering. The Bible says none of them are without significance. The longer I live, the more I realize that the kingdom of God has to be taken by force. This name it and claim it, believe it and receive it. I hear folks say, but I'm a believer. So is the devil. And when he believes, he shakes and trembles. And I see folks that you can just live so casual and just flippantly say, but I believe. Well, what about I serve, I walk with, I dedicate my life to, I repent, I get up, I start over. Hello? And we can all do that and need to. Repentance requires force. It requires focus. I cannot repent without focusing my attention on my wretched sinfulness and his great mercies. I can't repent by just saying, Jesus, I'm sorry, and uh, well now, Lord. That's an apology. An apology doesn't mean anything except you got room to go do the same thing all over again. Repentance means you turn from the sin unto the living God. And you cry out, oh God, have mercy on me. That takes violence. Your nature don't want to do that. Well, I'm just not that way, Brother Lashley. Okay. Receiving the Holy Ghost requires focus. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that the reason many people have such a difficulty receiving the Holy Ghost it's because they're distracted. What's my wife going to think? What's my husband going to think? What's my children going to think? What's my grandpa going to think? What's the who, the what, the where, the where, the how? Instead of grabbing your focus and saying, oh, God, thank you for the gift of life. Focusing your attention on God and God alone. Hey, folks, I've been in the altar before. 
before there was any altar teaching. You've never been prayed for until you go to Arkansas. And they'll slobber on you and spit on you and shake you. And, and they, they don't know what, what uh, mints are. Garlic and onion is the law of the day. And they'll shake you and spin you and wrap their arms around you like a, like a, they think, an airplane. And just, come on, praise Jesus. And they think they're praising. Praise him. Honey, my lumbago is killing me. But there comes a time when you have to forget it all. Those praying around you. Alan was a, a young Methodist barber. He was a good man. He loved God. I went to meet him first week that I was, uh, the first weekend I was in uh, uh, Lone Oak, Arkansas. I was preaching a revival. pastor took me to meet him. They had been discussing God and the Holy Ghost. Alan had just gotten out of the hospital. Whenever I met him, he looked at me and said, Brother Lashley, I'd love to come to your revival. But he said, the doctor told me that for the next week I can't get out of the bed. And then for the following week, I can't get out of the house. I said, Alan, I'm sure you got a good doctor, and he's very conscientious. But he only knows what he knows. And he doesn't know that we started last night a two-week revival. But the devil, the enemy of your soul, knows. And he put those words in a caring doctor's heart and mouth. This is just good, you know, safety first. And while I'm just talking to him, the Holy Ghost come up on me. I'm not normally this type. A boldness come up on me. I said, Alan, do you want the Holy Ghost? Yes, sir. I said, do you believe God wants you to have the Holy Ghost? Yes, sir. I said, then you get out of that bed tonight. And you come to this revival, and by the authority of the name of Jesus, I declare to you, you will not have a relapse of pneumonia. I don't normally talk like that. He said, I'll be there. We walked out of the man's house. By the time I got to the pastor's car, I was breaking. I was just burning up with a fever. The rest of that day, I was so feverish I could care, scarcely walk. I had pneumonia several times, so I knew I had all the symptoms of pneumonia. The pastor said, oh, my Lord, Brother Lashley, let me take you to the hospital. I said, forget it. Do you have any idea what it would do to the faith of Alan? After what I've said, I go to a hospital? Forget it. This is not natural. Come on, folks. I'm telling you, there are things that we suffer that there's a spiritual root to it. It does not have anything to do with your flesh except you're in pain. Are you willing to stick with it? Are you willing to believe God? Come on, I'm not talking about being foolish. I'm talking about being faithful. I'm talking about simply living the simple life of trusting God. He kept me out all day. Finally, he said, Brother, that's what I'm going to do for you. I said, please take me home. Take me to the parsonage. He let me out. I said, you can pray for me. But I just believe you ought to let me go get you a shot anyway. I said, I don't need a shot. I don't need the hospital. I need prayer. I went stumbling into the parsonage and fell across the bed. And Alice was praying for me. And after a while, it come time to go to church. i got to get up. And, and I'm one of these guys that think that if I can get hot enough, I can sweat it out. And so I run me a bathtub of water as hot as I can possibly stand. I slip down in that bathtub and just cringe until my body adjusts to the temperature. After a while, I'm pouring sweat, just pumping sweat. And then all of a sudden, I'm saying, Alice, Alice. I fell out of the bathtub trying to get up. I, she set me down on the stool, and here I am in all of my wet, naked glory, and I, I'm, I'm just terrible. And, and she said, what am I going to do? I said, help me to the bed. She dropped me on the bed, and I passed out. I come to in about 20 minutes or so, and I said, i got to get ready for church. i got to go to church. Honey, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to preach. You're going to preach? Long story short, I went to church. 
I told the pastor, I said, tell the folks, this is not contagious. This is not physical except for the pain. I won't get around any of them. I wrapped my trench coat around my neck, turned my collar up. I stepped in the pulpit, and I grabbed the pulpit, and I would preach for a while, and then he brought me a chair, and I'd just sit down in the chair and huff and puff, and, and then I'd get to talking about the word of the Lord in the chair, and I'd jump up and fall back down in the chair. Alan came to the altar that night. I watched him get prayed for in Arkansas. He was fresh meat to the piranhas. I watched them ring him every way possible. And he was just so obliging. Whatever they wanted, he was like pliable clay. He wanted the Holy Ghost. Don't tell me you can't receive the Holy Ghost. I had a man tell me one time, he said, Brother Lashley, it took me 10 years to get the Holy Ghost. I said, no, it didn't. He looked at me. I said, respectfully, sir, I realize your age, and I realize you're wrong. It didn't take you 10 years to get the Holy Ghost. It took you 10 years to get yourself out of the way. God's ready to give you the Holy Ghost first moment you called on him. But you couldn't focus your faith. They left Allen. They prayed for him on a Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Every night I come wrapped in my overcoat, sitting up here on the platform. Can't get down among them because I promised them I wouldn't. Friday night, he wasn't responding. So they left him because the town drunk came in and sat on the back pew. And she happened to be a woman. All those that work in the altar, suddenly they got interest in praying for this town drunk. Now, I'm not against the town drunk. They need the Holy Ghost. I've seen drunks come to the altar and get sobered up and be filled with the Holy Ghost. God's just that anxious to fill with his spirit. Alan's standing down here, long, tall, six foot three or so, slim guy. They've forsaken him down here by himself. Didn't know how to pray, but he's just trying. I walked over, my overcoat on, I walked down beside him, I looked up at him, I said, Alan, you remember my questions? You believe God wants you to have the Holy Ghost? Yes, sir. I said, do you want the Holy Ghost? Yes, sir. I said, Alan, I want you to forget what everybody's ever said to you while they're praying with you. I want you to forget about how they told you to pray. Just raise your hands. And ask God for the Holy Ghost. It's a gift. I stood there and watched that guy raise his head, eyes wide open. Now, folks, if you can't focus with your eyes open, I suggest you close them. But there's no law in the book that says you've got to shut your eyes to receive the Holy Ghost. I watched this little fellow, or this tall guy, as he raised his hands about like this. And he said, Jesus, sweet Jesus, my Jesus. And he never stopped talking. And he never changed cadence. And he never screamed and hollered. But he started speaking in tongues. Jesus, sweet Jesus, my Jesus. Now, if he hadn't repented, they did a lot of ringing of him for in vain. He had really poured his heart out. He was ready to receive God. I look back at his wife. Sweet lady, but you couldn't see the sweetness for the hatred that was in her eyes. She was stuck in her church, and she didn't want nothing to do with this Pentecostal bunch. I looked up at her, and if looks could kill, I'd have had daggers that went through my head and pinned me to the wall. But then I watched as it changed. When he started speaking in tongues, her eyes went wide. She couldn't hear him back there. She couldn't even see his face. It was this way, and she's in the back. But she jumped to her feet and come running down the aisle. She got around in front of him, and she looked up. She's a little short girl. She grabbed him by the belt, dropped to her knees, buried her forehead against his belt buckle, and said, Jesus, me too, me too, and started speaking in tongues. Focus. The simple life. Trust God. Obey God. I've got to finish. I... Receiving the Holy Ghost requires focus. I have to force myself to focus on Him alone. Me too, Jesus. 
Jesus, sweet Jesus, my Jesus, focus on him. Fix my heart. God, you said, God, you're here. I love you. I thank you for your mercy. Oh, Lord, I worship you. Don't worry about what who's going to say. The Lord said, take no thought. Romans, Matthew 6, 23, or 33. Verse 31, he says, don't take any thought about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, where you're going to live, what's going to take place. He said, these are what the world looks after. These are the natural things that the Gentiles seek. That's their whole focus in life. But he says in verse 33, but seek ye first. Seek ye first, not me first, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all that the world seeks after his necessities will be added to you. Let me read it to you from the message translation. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can't respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way God works fusses over these things. But you know both God and how he works. He's talking to his disciples. Steep your life. Anybody ever steep tea? Anybody here know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about the instant. I'm talking about the little bag that steeps. He said, steep your life in God reality, in God initiative, in God provision. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what he may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Living for God is the simple life. Stand, please. Another course we sing often is, Oh, how he loves you and me. I'm still trying to wrap my heart and my mind about the depth, the length, the height, the breadth of the love of God. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. God's grace is free, but it calls for an humble and grateful response. Don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. If you're going to live for God, decide you're going to do it now. First Chronicles 29, verse 2, David said, I have prepared with all of my might. For the house of the Lord my God. Verse 3 he says. Because I set my affections to the house of my God. And verse 5. I close with it. Who then is willing this day. To consecrate his service. Unto the Lord. Every eye closed. Every head bowed. Consider it. Consider it sincerely, my friend. The simple life. The focused life. The purposed life. There is no elation. There is no joy. There is, there is nothing to compare with knowing that I am claimed that God says in the day that I make up my jewels, I will gather them. That I'm invited. Whosoever will, come. Come to repentance. If you haven't repented, come on, get a good look at your sin. This is not a religious exercise. This is life or death. Come on. Be filled with His Spirit. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. 
Make up your mind. I'm going to be baptized, and I'm going to be baptized like the apostles baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins. Who then is willing this day consecrate his services unto the Lord? The altar's open. Anybody want to come pray? Anybody want to come and renew? Anybody want to come and say, Lord, I'm going to simply live. I'm going to live for you. In spite of my weaknesses, in spite of my my, uh, incapacities, in spite of distractions, in spite of frustrations and failures, I know you will not abandon me and I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to focus my attention upon you. I'm going to set my affections on you. Lord, I will get up every time I stumble and say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to live the simple life, a life of trust, a life of consecration and dedication. I'm going to believe you, Lord. I'm going to believe that you're going to make a way where there seems to be no way. I worship you, O Lord. I worship you. Come on. Pour out your heart to the Lord, he said. Pour it out. And God will fill it full with his grace, with his goodness, with his compassion, with his mercies, with his joy, with his peace, with his blessings. Blessed are the pure in heart. Come on, I want my life, Lord, to have one focus. Everything else, Lord, I'm going to see through that focus. I want to focus on you. I want to focus on your will. I want to focus on your plan. I want to focus on your presence. You're ever with me, Lord. I want to focus on your promise. Oh, God, you're here and you're here for me. I'm willing today. Oh, God, as far as I can go, I'm willing today to consecrate my service to you. I'm going to put my life into your hands afresh. I'm going to say, not my will. Not my will, Lord, but thine be done. Oh, God. Oh, God, my God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God, my God. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Make me what I ought to be. Help me, Lord, to be more like thee. Help me to be a witness unto you. Your anointing flow through me, transform me, constantly cleanse and renew and restore me. In the name of Jesus. Come on, that's it. Just call upon the Lord. God, here is my life, such as it is. I give it to you. I don't know how to live without you, Lord. <laughs> I don't have to live without you. I'm just going to live. Because you said live. And it doesn't matter what my circumstances are. I'm going to live anyhow. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to live. Because you said live.
Take my fear, take my life. I surrender to your will, to your way, to your plan. I surrender, take my pride, take my fear, take my life. I surrender to your will, to your way, to your plan. I surrender, take my pride, take my fear, take my life. I surrender to your way, to your will, to your plan. I surrender, take my pride, take my fear, take my life. I surrender to your will, to your way, to your plan. I surrender. There's only one way that can happen. You and I have to decrease. There's no more space. You can't create more room. You've got to make room by pushing something out. I want to walk more sensitive to the Spirit of the Lord. Bishop spoke of those voices. I was thinking that it was just in this modern day when we just seem to be so numb in our emotions. It really takes something to move the emotions. We've been, had our emotions so manipulated. Bishop was talking about sales earlier. You know, our emotions get caught up in sales pitches and advertising. That's what draws us emotionally in. And Hollywood has used every device imaginable to invade our life with their philosophy and so much of it touches through our emotions funny or sad or scary emotions and all of that crowds out the presence of the Lord we have this tendency to put up this shield because we don't want to be emotional the problem is when we do that we shut out the presence of God we can't feel that nudge of His Spirit stirring in our emotions we are body soul and spirit and the soul is the seat of the emotions our emotions ought to be stirred in the presence of God when he starts ministering the psalmist said in Psalm 119 37 turn mine eyes away from beholding vanity that's step one but then he said and quicken thou me in thy way I was reading last night and if if you don't have this I'd encourage you to get it. it's called morning and evening with Charles Spurgeon Charles Spurgeon was a pastor in London in the 1800s he was called the Prince of Preachers and I was reading a little bit of his biography last night but I was reading this he's put out these devotionals and this just spoke to me because it's so fit it talked to me he said the psalmist said quicken me in thy way He's confessing that he is dull, heavy, lumpy, all but dead. Mr. Spurgeon says, perhaps, dear reader, you feel the same way. He said, we are so sluggish that the best motives cannot quicken us apart from the Lord himself. And then he exclaims, what? Will not hell quicken me? Shall I think of sinners perishing and yet not be awakened? Will not heaven quicken me? Can I think of the reward that awaiteth the righteous and yet be cold? 
Will not death quicken me? Can I think of dying and standing before my God and yet be slothful in my master's service? Will not Christ's love constrain me? Can I think of his dear wounds? Can I sit at the foot of his cross and not be stirred with a fervency and zeal? It seems so. No mere consideration. Listen to this. No mere consideration. Talking about our intellect. So often we preach the word and like those in Athens, we want something new. We want something that can, oh, wow, what a revelation. He said, no mere consideration can quicken us to zeal, but God himself must do it. Hence the cry, quicken thou me. The psalmist breathes out his whole soul in vehement pleadings. His body and soul unite in prayer. Turn away mine eyes, says the body. Quicken thou me, cries the soul. This is a fit prayer for every day. O oh Lord, hear it this night. That spoke to me because that was written in the 1800s. We sometimes think that we face things today that nobody's ever faced before. We may face it in a new the avenue, but there's nothing new under the sun. The more things change, the more they stay the same. We just have to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow Jesus. But it takes the Spirit to do that. I pray that as you are fasting, I, I hope and pray that as many as possible, I, I, I wish but I think it's wishful thinking. I wish that everybody would partake of it, at least the media fast. We have no idea the stuff that clouds our mind. No wonder we can't focus on God. No wonder we can't tap into the Spirit of God. We got so many other things, not evil things, just carnal things, just things that are filling up that space that He wants to fill up. Would you capitalize on this opportunity? We've got one more week. Maybe you haven't done anything until now. Can I tell you just one day, if you make up your mind, by the end of this week, you can be walking in such a dimension that you never imagined. It's available to each and every one of us. And I invite you, let's go. Let's do it together. I would ask that in pastor's place today, I'll ask that please, if you are doing an extended fast, would you please eat before the weekend or before Sunday service? Normally we break the fast on Saturday evening. I invite you to do that so you can have strength so that we can come together next Sunday, worship the Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for challenging us. God, I want to go on. I want to be more for you. I don't ever want to let up, God. I want to keep drawing nearer to you. I want to walk in a new level, a new dimension. And only by your grace is that possible. Would you lead and guide us this week, Lord? Quicken us. Quicken us by your spirit, we ask. In your precious name, go with each one as we leave this place. We'll give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. God bless you. Remember, Pastor, ask the Lord to continue to give him strength. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.